All right. Um, so I guess uh, just kind of let's start with the uh, with stuff relating to the exam and the paper. So I, I've given you the review sheets, right? So we'll talk these over in a more official capacity on Wednesday, right? So um, what you should do with the vocab terms they've given you, right? Um, you know, just go down the list, see if you can define all of them and connect them to prop to texts. If you have questions about any of them, mark them and bring that with you on Wednesday. Um, and if you are able to answer most of the vocab questions, that will also help you a lot with the essay portion. Um, so, um, yeah. Do you have any, so do you have any questions about that? When we actually take the midterm, we get to choose the vocab, basically, right? Or yeah. We do all of them. Yeah, so, so what, what I'm going to do is give you a list of 12 terms, mm -hmm. and you'll pick eight. Okay. Now, some of these terms on the vocab uh, sheet can be easily linked, yeah. and so I might give them to you as one term, right? So I might ask you, say, to define abrogation and appropriation together, right, as one yeah. term. But yeah, if, um, but I won't put anything on the exam that's not on this sheet. Okay. And everything that is on this sheet mm -hmm. has been in a past vocab quiz, and it's all been stuff that we've discussed in class, right? So like, like I am, like I am 100% not interested in playing gotcha with tests, right? You know, so you're seeing how close you're paying attention, whatever, right? You know, but like, I what I want to see is how well you've observed the material, absorbed the material that we've gone over so far. Mm -hmm. that's, that's what I care about. Fine. Which is why the, the exams are worth a lot less than the paper as well, right? So it's... Yeah. <laughs> uh, I think that would be all. Okay. That's more probably Yeah, and again, like we will, we'll go over all this on Wednesday. You have any questions about the paper? Um, I did the proposal, but I think I'm going to send it to you when I go to my Bible talk. Yeah. So I can see if I need some other work on it before I turn it in on Wednesday. Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm, happy, I'm happy to give you feedback yeah, before you turn it in. Yeah. Yeah, no, yeah, no problem. Um, I probably won't be able to get back to you until tomorrow morning. That's perfect. Fine. And yeah, um, just, I'm. We're doing the community theater production of Oliver, mm -hmm. and so that's taking up all my nights, and it's exhausting. And yes. <laughs> at least yeah, I so, will remember to send it because yeah, I, I yeah. have bad memories when it comes to that. Yeah. And email is the one thing I forget. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I, I would say I'll, I'll send you a reminder to send it to me, mm -hmm. but I may very well forget when we leave the class as well. So if I remember to, I will send you a reminder. Yeah. Okay. Um, I got my laptop with me. I'm gonna have it out for the dollars class. Okay. Okay, cool. Alright. Okay then. So let's just I guess go ahead and dig into the arrivals. So what, what do you what do you think of this? Oh I've I paid attention to it this time. Okay, good. I read good. it. <laughs> I was just distracted with a phone call when I was reading it. Uh-huh. And not the best conditions under which to read, yeah. I listen to music when I do reading, but mm -hmm. on a phone call now. But I think I'm, I like it, but I'm just mostly confused because I'm trying to answer the reading questions as well. Okay. And some of the questions I was not able to answer, like all the questions I didn't answer. <laughs> but I think the number two, like creation of myth, okay, and the Calypso, I was confused on that. Like I'm reading, reading, like where does it say anything about myth? Okay, um, it, it's, um, the first part of this is kind of a creation myth um, of the Caribbean, like, like, kind of like a, uh, a non-scientific account of the creation mm -hmm. of the world, or at least of the Caribbean, right? Mm -hmm. And I think like, like the name Calypso is meant to evoke myth as well. It's actually, like it's one of those things, and like this is a thing Braithwaite does a lot, um, I think we were talking about this last time. Like he, he loves puns and he loves linguistic ambiguity. So Calypso, K 
can refer to two things, right? So the first thing it refers to is a character from Greek mythology. So Calypso is the nymph who imprisons Odysseus on her island. So have you read the Odyssey? I read it back in ninth grade. Okay. In Tennessee. Because <laughs> the Atlanta schools do not talk about the Odyssey. Okay. At all. We're, we're the Tennessee schools do, huh? Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, but yeah, so when, when we first meet Odysseus in that in that epic, right? Uh, he is on the island of Ogygia, which is ruled by a nymph named Calypso, who has been trying to keep him there. Uh, and make him love her. So it's um, so the Calypso story is um, a captivity narrative, and also in some sense a kind of sexual slavery narrative. And as we go through this, we'll see that like both of these are relative are relevant to what's going on in the. Um, the other meaning of the word calypso, um, it's a form of Caribbean folk music. We were talking about that last class, and you said just to show me what the calypso music was. Yeah, so what I'm going to do in a minute, I have a recording here of Braithwaite reading the poem, and he's reading it in a kind of in the rhythm that's common to calypso music. So that might help uh, to, um, yeah, that might help you to kind of like understand it. And also kind of like some of the rhythmic method of the poem as well, right? Because um, yeah, he, he's, he's, he's basing his, um, his meters less on like the kind of traditional stressed, unstressed syllables and more on musical forms. But yes, yeah, so Calypso is a Caribbean folk, form of Caribbean folk music that is uh, usually loaded with socio-political commentary and is also particularly associated with the carnival season. So, do um, you, you know what, what carnival or carnival is? I'm thinking of the... Um the cruise company. Because <laughs> <laughs> they are not, carnival as well, but no, yeah, yeah. Like a, no, um, not quite, although definitely associated with exploitation in the Caribbean. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's mostly something, I'm going to say like amusement parks itself, but okay, those are different. Okay, so yeah, that, that, that's, that's what a carnival, small c, is. Yeah, mm -hmm. Carnival with a capital C um, is, it's like Mardi Gras, right? So it, it's the it's kind of like a big blowout party with parades and loud music and elaborate costumes, mm -hmm. usually right at the beginning of Lent. Mm -hmm. So Calypso is associated with that time of year, with that season. So like with a great big like last blowout party mm -hmm. before you have to start giving things up, right? And kind of sacrificing for 40 days. Mm -hmm. Okay, so before we dig more deeply into this, let me just play the po play Braithwaite reading the poem for you, and we'll see what this what he what he intended for this to sound like. The stone had skinned, art and bloomed into islands, Cuba and San Domingo, Jamaica, Puerto Rico, Grenada, Guadalupe, Bonaire. Curved stone hissed into reef, wave teeth find into clay, white splash flashed into spray, Bathsheba, Montego Bay, bloom of the arcing summers. The islands roared into green plantations ruled by silver sugar cane, sweat and profit, cutless profit, islands ruled by sugar cane. And of course it was a wonderful time, a profitable, hospitable, well worth your time, when captains carried receipts for rices, letters, spices, wigs, 
opera glasses, swaggering asses, debtors, vices, pigs. Oh, it was a wonderful time, an elegant, benevolent, redolent time. And young Mrs. P's quick, irrelevant crime at four o'clock in the morning. But what of black sound with the big splayed toes and the shoe black shiny skin? He carries bucketfuls of water cause his ma's just had another daughter. And what of John with a European name who went to school and dreamt of fame? His boss one day called him a fool, and the boss hadn't even been to school. Steel drum, steel drum, hit the hot calypso dancing, hot rum, hot rum, who going stop this bacchanaling? For we glance the banjo, dance the limbo, grow our crops by malju, have loose morals, gather corals, father our neighbor's quarrel. Perhaps when they come with their cameras and straw hats, sacred pink tourist from the frozen north, we should get down to those white beaches where if we don't wear breeches, it becomes an island dance. Some people doing well while others are catching hell. Oh, the boss gave our Johnny the sack, though we beg him, please, please to take him back. So the boy now migrating overseas. So the sung parts of this are like that's that's kind of like what what calypso sounds like. Mm -hmm. So I don't know, like if you've ever heard like any like old Harry Belafonte records. Harry Belafonte. Okay. Um, this is going to be a weird example, but have you ever seen the movie Beetlejuice? Okay, so all of the music that Alec Baldwin is always playing, mm -hmm. that's calypso music. Oh. Like I, I just like I, I just thought of that example. That this that's, is. <laughs> that's, um, you watch Beetlejuice. Then. Yes. So, but yeah, this is kind of what, like when we were um, talking last time about how Braithwaite didn't feel the usual rhythms of English language poetry mm -hmm. captured Caribbean experience, right? So what he's done here with this poem is giving it almost kind of like a shuffling dance rhythm, right? Um, even the parts that are spoken, um, like you can kind of imagine dance steps attached to them. Um, <clears throat> so let's maybe try to break this poem down to kind of like, it, this occurs like almost right smack dab in the middle of rites of passage. So I think from here we can maybe kind of extend outward, right? So let's start with part one here, right? The stone had skidded, arced, and bloomed into islands. Cuba and San Domingo, Jamaica and Puerto Rico, Granada, Guadalupe, Bonaire, curved stone, hissed into reef, wave teeth fanged into clay, white splash flashed into spray, Bathsheba, Montego Bay, bloom of the arcing summers. So this is like, like, let's try to think here about how he imagines the islands of the Caribbean coming into being. What do you, what do you think of the, the language, he's at page 48, the language he uses here to describe this process of these, these islands coming into being? Like, what does this look like? This seems to be like yeah one of those group voices right you know maybe like in a, yeah, not not a specific person but yeah I mean, perhaps a, a group yeah so the stone had skidded art and bloomed into islands try to like imagine that visually for a moment like what does that look like When I think about the stone to skid, I'm thinking like how you throw rocks across the water, you see if it skips. Yeah, pond, skipping stones pond. across a pond, exactly. Yeah. yeah, good. Yeah, that's ex that's exactly the image here, right? And what happens when you skip that stone across the pond? What does it create? It creates um, 
wave vibrations of the waters. I can't figure out the actual word. Yeah. There's these, ripples in the Exactly, water. yeah, these ripples that kind of circle out from the, each place where the stone hits, right? Mm -hmm. And yeah, that's kind of what, that, that's the image that, that I think Brathwaite is going for here, that we've got this stone skidding across the surface of the water, mm -hmm. um, and each place it stops, right, these ripples mm -hmm. conjure up another island, right? But what do we know about like the, these ripples when you skip a stone across the water? What what happens with each of those ripples? The water gets bigger and bigger. They start off small, then they get uh -huh. bigger and bigger and bigger. Yeah, they expand, right? Until they what? Sink. Yeah, they just disappear, right? So <clears throat> they grow and then vanish. And I think that's actually kind of important to keep in mind in a poem that's largely about the instability of home or feeling like you don't really have a home, right? Mm -hmm. That these rings, you know, these islands that are created by skipping the stone um, are kind of ephemeral. They're not permanent. This is just kind of like a place where you're stopping for a moment before you move on to someplace else. But I think that the, the word bloomed here, right, recur, bloomed, bloom, recurs as well. And what does that suggest? Growth. Growth, yeah, growth of what specifically? Since it's still talking about the uh, stones, uh -huh. I guess the growth of the water, the ripples in the water. Okay. So yeah, we, we could yeah we we could we we, we talk about like that as being all. We sometimes even use the word bloom to describe that kind of motion, right? But what else blooms? Flowers. Oh, Flowers. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I think it is also meant to conjure up. Flowers, because remember back to Wide Sargasso Sea, right? The things that are constantly kind of like both seducing and repelling Rochester about the Caribbean, right? Are these wild growths of flowers? Yeah, he'll 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 be seduced by them by them for a minute, right? He'll sniff them, he'll inhale, he'll inhale deeply, and then he'll get mad and he'll crush it, right? I think there's a lot of things that people do, like, oh, look at that little pretty flower step. Uh -huh. Oh, look at the little ants carrying the food step. Yeah. <laughs> it's human nature. I can't believe that. Sure. But in, in, in Reese's novel, it seems almost to be like a, petty. a more kind of, de yeah, it's pe a petty and like kind of deliberate refusal to get suckered in by this, right? It's like, I'm not going to let this thing seduce me. So I'm going to crush it. Crush his hopes and dreams. Yes. So then as we have the islands kind of blooming, right, they are kind of blooming into plant life here as well, right? The islands roared into green plantations, ruled by silver sugarcane, sweat and profit, cutlass profit, islands ruled by sugarcane. And of course it was a wonderful time, a profitable, hospitable, well worth your time, when captains carried receipts for rices, letters, spices, wigs, opera glasses, swaggering asses, debtors, vices, pigs, Oh, it was a wonderful time, an elegant, benevolent, reveling time, and young Mrs. P's quick, irrelevant crime at four o'clock in the morning. Dot, dot, dot. So, one thing that it might be useful to do in trying to understand this particular poem is to think of it as a kind of historical progression, right? So we start with the creation of the islands. And then we get the period after bloom, right? We bloom into the green plantations. And what period in Caribbean history does this seem to be talking about? We're talking about plantations and sugarcane. Slavery? 
Yeah, exactly. Yeah, this yeah, this is the yeah, the, the period of enslavement. So yeah, um, 17th and 18th centuries. And from whose perspective is this a wonderful, profitable, hospitable, well worth your time? I feel like it's a salesman. <laughs> like, oh, it would be worth your time to buy this expensive vacuum cleaner that you obviously don't need, but you want it. Okay, well, I, th I think you're picking up again. There's the, this repetition of the word profit here, right? Who's profiting from all the sugar cane? The slave masters. Yeah, the slave masters, the plantation owners, right? Those Anglo West Indians who would have been um, Antoinette Cosway's um, ancestors, right? In White Sargasso Sea. Good, yeah, so. Yeah, so this is more from the perspective of. It's either from the perspective of the plantation owners, or it's meant to be ironic. And those two things aren't mutually exclusive, right? It could be uh, a voice of a black West Indian uh, being sarcastic. It can also be the voice of um, one of you know a, a white person you know longing for these past days, right? Um, do you understand what young Mrs. P's quick irrelevant crime at four o'clock in the morning is? Where is it the, the the last two lines of uh, part two of Calypso. Bottom of page forty-eight. Prostitution, no, no. but yeah, but think about like for example how uh, Daniel. Like, think about like Daniel Cosway's parentage, right? Uh -huh. That you know he is maybe the son of old Mr. Cosway and one of his slaves, right? Mm -hmm. So Mrs. P's quick irrelevant crime, yeah, is uh, having sex with some of the slaves, yeah. So this relates back to the Greek myth of Odysseus. And I think it's also probably worth noting that Odysseus right, is best known for wandering around the Mediterranean for a decade trying to get home, right? So Odysseus is himself a wanderer in search of home. who was captured for a decade by the nymph Calypso, who won't let him go, and demands that he share her bed. So, <clears throat> much like young Mrs. P here. But what of Black Sam with the big splayed toes and the shoe black shiny skin? He carries bucketfuls of water, because his ma's just had another daughter. And what of John with a European name, who went to school and dreamt of fame? His boss one day called him a fool, and the boss hadn't even been to school. So let's kind of focus on this last stanza here, John with the European name, who went to school and dreamt of fame. What is this, what is this picture of John that we're given here? It's a little more complicated than that, right? So first off, what are we told about John's name? He's a European. Yeah, John is a European name. And who would have, uh, 
even after emancipation and independence in uh, most Caribbean nations, whose system was the school system based on? Yeah, so if John is going to school, right, uh -huh. is he likely learning things from, you know, say, a Barbadian or Trinidadian perspective? Uh -huh. Or is he likely to be learning things from an English perspective? English perspective? Yes, exactly. So John, with the European name, went to school and dreamt of fame, right, is an assimilationist, right? He's trying to get ahead by conforming to British values, or at least to a certain set of British values and expectations, right? Because as we see in the next part of this, there are actually different sets of European values and expectations, right? So John is trying to conform to the being like a European set of values. Now, in part three here, right, we've got steel drum, steel drum, hit the hot calypso dancing, hot rum, hot rum, who going to stop this back in Allen? For we glance the banjo, dance the limbo, grow our crops by Maljo, Maljo is black magic. Have loose morals, gather corals, father our neighbor's quarrels. Perhaps when they come with their cameras and straw hats, sacred pink tourists from the frozen north, we should get down to those white beaches where if we don't wear breeches, it, become an, it becomes an island dance. So this carnival show that Braithwaite describes people putting on, Who is it really for? For whose benefit is it? And how does it relate to this idea of European expectations of the Caribbean and specifically of the Black Caribbean? I feel like the only person that benefit from it is the slave masters. So they can make a profit from it. Okay. Well, then at this point, the slave masters are back in history, right? Yeah. So we're, we're kind of, we've moved to the present now. But I think... I, I think you do kind of, there is a valid point in there too, is like, does it actually seem like things are much different? I mean, people are partying, right? Yeah. But are they partying because they think it's fun? People party because it's fun, but somebody's <laughs> making a profit off of the okay. party. Yeah. And Especially think, if you pay at the door. Yeah. And the, the good here that's being sold mm -hmm. isn't sugar cane anymore. Although that's referenced in the hot rum, hot rum. Mm -hmm. The good that's being sold is the experience of the Caribbean party. And, and the Caribbean is... Yeah, the yeah. Right, the experience of you know, you know, Carnival is being sold here, right? Mm -hmm. And it's being sold... Right, perhaps when they come with their cameras and straw hats, sacred pink tourists from the frozen north, right? So instead of the Anglo West Indian slave owners exploiting black West Indians for work and sex, the black West Indians are now putting on a show to extract money from white tourists. So one could argue that there's a shift in the power dynamic, right? That you know now, you know, the tables have turned. Oh how tables have turned. But the show they're putting on is one that conforms to white prejudices and white opinions about black West Indians, right? Give, you know, just kind of giving people what they expect. So in that sense, 
these sacred pink tourists from the frozen north still hold the power, still hold the cards, right? They may not have people in shackles anymore, but they're going to take those tourist dollars elsewhere mm. if you don't give them the show that they expect, right? Yeah. If you don't <clears throat> behave the way they, ex they, they think you're going to. It's like I'm going to use and up with us. everybody. Spring break, summer vacation goes to Florida. Uh huh. And because there's something going, like anything going right in Florida, that oh, you know, they spend money for this hotel, they spend money to go to sure. the set club. This, yeah, yeah. Yeah. If it's right, then people will go. Florida, California might be the go to places people to. Yeah, well, it's, it's like, have you ever heard the term before tourist trap? Yes. They trap us with really good attractions. Yeah, or sometimes attractions that just look like they're good, but and then turn out turn out to be lousy and overpriced, right? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. It's like you know, like uh, you know, there's you know, you know, restaurants and bars that you know charge too much and have lousy foods and drink, but are in like a but are in a good location, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. So you're you're, you're paying through the nose for something that that actually isn't very that actually isn't as good as other things you could get locally but you don't know any better because you're not from there yeah. right so yeah that, that's and I think that's kind of what's going on here but the indication is that <clears throat> this is a, the, the tourist trap is a trap for the people who have to put on the show too right because it means they have to behave a certain way yeah. to keep getting the money they don't, then nobody wants to go see the carnival. Yeah, yeah. And then we finish here with, oh, the boss gave our Johnny the sack, though we beg him, please, please, to take him back. So the boy now migrated overseas. So the fact that Brathwaite uses the word migrating rather than migrate. Right, right. This is, of course, you know, no, no accident. It's not, you know, just kind of like it's, it's the, it's the kind of play with language that he does throughout this, right? Mm -hmm. So, what do you think he means specifically by migrate? Uh, okay, so I think he, what he's trying to refer to here is a specifically black experience of migration, which is different from the you know, white experience of colonization and tourism, right? Um, and I think that part of what uh, goes into this is that much of this is involuntary migration. The migration of a colonist or settler, um, the migration of a tourist, right? Mm -hmm. Those are voluntary movement patterns, right? You're going someplace because you wanted to go there, or because you have some so you, some good reason. Like nobody forced you to go there, right? Um, but what he's pointing out is that most of the movements that the characters in these poems are making are not voluntary, whether you're, you're talking about you know, the original movement from Africa across the Atlantic um, you know, to the uh, kind of spreading out from the Caribbean across North America and into Britain. Right? You know, these are movements that are necessitated by something else, right? whether it's someone forcing you to move or the fact that you can't get work. Right? So you know, why is John, for example, gone overseas. Somebody gets the sack at work. They're going to basically get fired. 
yeah, exactly, he's been fired, right? He doesn't have a job, so he has to go elsewhere to look for one. I'm like, for what? Yeah, yeah. You gotta go to different mm -hmm. areas and locations, like, are you hired? And then they say no. Uh-huh. Yeah, but if yeah, if, if you live in a place where work is not easy to find because of say like economic underdevelopment, right? Mm -hmm. Then you have to go somewhere else. somewhere else. And so yeah, John would you know John slash Johnny would be probably a member, uh, especially you know, given you know when this poem is written, 1967, of that Windrush generation that we discussed when we looked at Louise Bennett a couple weeks ago, right? So do you remember what the Windrush generation was? Uh, I have to look at notes and 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 notes so the Windrush generation was um, that kind of like that generation of emigrants to the UK from the Caribbean, starting in the late 40s and ending in the early 60s, right? So after World War II, Britain um, passed a law that guaranteed right, uh, rights of residence and rights to work um, to any any British like to any person who had been born in a British dominion, right? And so, because there was a labor shortage in the UK, because there had been so much damage done by German bombing campaigns and so many you know so many young men of working age had died in the war. Um, there were a lot of particularly young men from the Caribbean who came to Britain uh, to try to to try to get work, to get jobs, and so John would probably be one of these young men. Right? And they're called the Windrush Generation because the first ship that brought immigrants over was the uh, the HMS Empire Windrush. So yes, our Johnny is probably one of these Windrush um, immigrants. So I think it's probably kind of like worth taking a minute, like doing a bird's eye view of the whole poem and breaking down what each of the four major sections are and what the titles mean. So we know what Calypso is. Yes. So. Although Calypso is a poem within the third section. Yeah. So our four sections here are Work Song and Blues, Spades. Um, part three, I think, is Islands and Exiles. Yes. And part four is the return. So part one, work song and blues. Um, it deals largely with the forced resettlement conditions um, experienced by slaves brought over from Africa, right? You know, work song and blues, like this refers specifically to musical forms um, that were developed um, on plantations as part of plantation labor. Uh, the Spades is another one of these titles that has multiple meanings. 
thinking of the card. What's that? I'm thinking of the card. The card? Okay, yeah, yeah, the, the, the ace of spades and a card. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so there are actually three things that this refers to. Right? The first, right, is, you know, a digging tool, you know, a shovel, a spade. The second is the symbol of a deity in Vudum called Baron Samedi. Or uh, but no, uh, but Baron Baron Samedi. It looked like like Baron uh, Baron Samedi, so like Baron Saturday is the, the name. But yeah, he, he is the uh, um, Baron Samedi is a death spirit. And are you you're familiar with him? Okay, no, <laughs> you're just agreeing with me. <laughs> Okay, yeah, Baron Samadhi is, is a death spirit, and his, he's uh, usually depicted as a very well-dressed black man um, who uh, like has three spades with him uh, for whatever reason. And in British English, this is specific to British English, spade is also a derogatory term for black Britons. And all three of these meanings are kind of meant to be encapsulated in this title. Right, the digging tool, the voodoo death spirit, and also uh, this kind of this, this nasty name. Um, that is used to denigrate black Britons. Um, and then Islands and Exiles. Exiles. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's <laughs> fairly self-explanatory, right? And then the return. You're coming back. Yes. Yeah. Um, execution? Exile. I can't remember the term right now. Exile. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And this is kind of return. Um, not really to your point of origin, because the Caribbean's not really the point of origin, but at least, yeah, kind of like this return to this earlier place to which you were exiled. And so there are a couple of themes and images that recur throughout, right? So one is a reference to drums and drumming, and this kind of runs through all four sections of the poem. And so maybe let's just kind of look at, let's look at the first poem in which this is referenced and see if we can kind of get something out of this. So page four the prelude in work song and blues. Right. Drum skin whip lash, master sun's cutting edge of heat, taut surfaces of things. I sing, I shout, I groan, I dream about. So what's the drum being compared to here? Think about it a little more, right? So what, 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 do you, what do you do to get sound out of a drum? Hit. You hit it, right? Beat, yeah. So what else is being hit here to make a sound? Um, a lash? Yeah, drum skin whip lash. So what he's doing here, so you know, this, the skin of a drum, right, is you know, the head that you stretch across it and you hit it to make a sound. Mm -hmm. And the sound of the drum is here being compared compared to the sound of a whiplash on skin, right? So we start with these per percussive noises, right? Um, but I think it, uh, part of what's going on here is <clears throat> the idea of 
the talking drum. Okay, so you remember, let's kind of think back to things fall apart, right? When, so like in Heart of Darkness, when, you know, the characters uh, hear drums in the woods, it's just something that terrifies them, right? When, say, like Okonkwo and his neighbors hear drums in the wood, what is it usually conveying to them? There's danger nearby. Could be danger, right? Could be, um, you know, someone has died, there's a few, there's going to be a funeral, right? Mm -hmm. But I think you know, the point being that the drum is used to convey information, right? Mm -hmm. Is that why in like, um, what is it, the ghost drum, I think Pet Cemetery, yes, you can't remember which version, <laughs> had the kids beating the drum and then other kids following behind the kid beating the drum. Maybe, I'm not, I, I, you know, I'm, I have to say I'm not really that familiar with Pet Cemetery, so I couldn't say for sure. <laughs> But yeah, I mean, like the, the, the concept here is basically the same as it would be in uh, Things Fall Apart. You know, the drums are used to convey information, right, to send messages. And so we, we start here with a drum being used to send a message, but the drum itself is the skin of someone being whipped, right? And it's sending a message about, like this actually kind of like then leads into one of the poem's other major themes here, right? Dust, glass, grit, the pebbles of the desert, sands shift, across the scorched world water ceases to flow. The hot wheeled caravans, carcasses rot, Camels wrecked in their own shit resurrect butterflies that dance in the noon without hope, without hope of a morning. Soon rock elephant hided boulders, dragged in now dry riverbeds, death's valleys. Here clay cool coal clings to glass, creates clinks, silica glitters, children of stars. Here cool dew falls in the evening, black birds blink on the tree, Stump ravished with fire, ruined with its gold. So, do you notice all the alliteration? Yes. And what a lot of that, like, it's sonically imitating drumming as well here, right? because most of these alliterative sounds are percussive sounds. Is the bird blinking also a little bit sound? Oh yeah, yeah, bird, yeah, bird blink, yeah. We can just start with that hard B center. Black birds blink, yeah. But those black birds blinking on the tree, right? You know, they're probably crows or ravens, right? Carrion birds. And I think uh, if we look at these two verse paragraphs, what kind of what kind of environment is being described here? Forest, the woods. Well, I mean, we only see one tree, right? It's just a stump ravished with fire. Uh, <laughs> okay, yeah, desert and dry riverbeds, right? Burn stump. I think the closest place would be the desert or um, the No, this seems actually kind of like the opposite of an oasis, yeah. right? An oasis is a lush place in the middle of the desert. This is, yeah, just desert. So remember that, you know, I, I mentioned one of the poems that inspired this, or that influenced this, is T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland, right? And so here we're actually getting a kind of wasteland, right? This, this kind of nasty, infertile place, right? And there's another reference to Greek myth here as well. The butterflies uh, in the camel shit, right? So, in Greek, the word psyche refers to both a butterfly and to the soul. So, I think that we're meant to. Think of these butterflies 
that are kind of coming to life in the camel shit as souls that dance in the noon without hope, without hope of a morning. And let's maybe think about that opposition between noon and morning here, right? Noon, everyone is active. In the morning, everybody is asleep. <laughs> well, let, let's, let's maybe think more about kind of like position and activity of the sun, right? What's the hottest part of the day? Yeah. Noon is, particularly if you live someplace hot, right? Noon is the hottest, most uncomfortable part of the day, right? Just bright light baking everything. So Arizona or Texas. <laughs> <laughs> okay, some kind of California. Whereas morning. Yeah, and the sun's just coming up, right? And, you know, there's a sense of movement, right? A new day, new hopes. There's dew on the ground, right? I mean, maybe not so much dew if you live in a desert. But, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but all that's baked dry by noon, right? I think like, you know, noon, when the sun is hanging in the middle of the sky, can also be kind of like, a, it can be representative of stasis. While morning, can be representative of newness and change. Build now the new villages. You must mix spittle with dirt, dung with saliva and sweat. Round mud walls will rise in the dawn. Walled cities arise from Savannah and Rock Riverbed. Okano Bamako Gao. But populations of flies arise from the cattle towns. Blood sucking tripanosoma. Milk curdles in the in udder and nipple in mouth. Flies nibble and ulcer. Tight silverback swarms bringing silence, the slender proboscis of rot. In the hot harmaton, in the hot harmaton, dead bodies settle and quiver, given up to the blanket that covers and warms from the heat of the final cold, until suddenly burst. The buzzing black zones that were silence swirl through the sunlight, the left festering flesh they had covered, runnelled and hold like dust under raindrops, soil under rain. But no rain comes while the flesh rots, while the flies swarm. But across the dried out gut of the riverbed look, the trees are cool, their leaves are green, there burns the dream of a fountain, garden of odors, soft alleyways. So build, build again the new villages. You must mix spittle with dirt, dung to saliva and sweat, making mortar. Leaf work for the roof and vine tendrils. But square frames crack, wood rots, Smooth mortar, mortar too remains mortal, trapped in its own salt, its unstable foundations of water. So grant, God, that this house will stand the four winds, the season's alterations, the explorations of the worm. So <clears throat> I think the most important parts of this portion that I've just read thematically are the first first paragraph I just read and the last one, because both are concerned with building, right? And if we think about the title that Brathwaite gives to his whole series and kind of the meaning we attached to that word last time, this notion of being arrivants, right? Do we remember kind of like what, what it means to be arrivant in a place? Yeah, the arrivant is someone who is eternally just showing up, right? Not necessarily settling, just showing up. It's like you show up really, really late. <laughs> a frat party, or you just show up really late. Uh -huh. Like you just arrived to a dinner. I don't know what other people arrive late to besides parties. 
So that's birthday dinner. Uh huh. That's about it. <laughs> Well, but in, in this case, like, like where, where they're arriving is a place where they're expected to live, right? Mm -hmm. But there's no sense of permanence. Yeah. I think what we get in these kind of like repeated acts of building mm -hmm. is this kind of constant starting over. Always building a new village, a new city, mm -hmm. only to have to move on again. Because that city is eventually going to decay or fall apart, right? You know, it's, it's <clears throat> right, there's no sense of permanence. And we see this referenced uh, towards the end of this as well in this kind of like refusal, there's, there's almost like a refusal to remember. Right, if we look on uh, page 70, there's this sequence, yeah, this part of the sequence here called the cabin. Which belonged to this ancestor figure we talked that we talked a little bit about last time, um, who recurs to the poem called Tom, and Tom is meant to evoke, right, Uncle Tom of Uncle Tom's cabin, right? You know, the <clears throat> mild-mannered, well-behaved slave uh, who patiently endures, waiting for better things. Under the burnt-out green of this small yard's tufts of grass, where water was once used to wash pots, pans, pose, ochre appears, a rusted bucket, hole kicked into its bottom, lies on its side. Fence, low wall of careful stones marking the square yard, is broken now, breached by pigs, by rats, by mongoose, and by neighbors. Eucalyptus bushes push their way amidst the marl. All looks so left, so unlived in. Yard, fence, and cavern. Here old Tom lived. His whole, ha his whole tight house no bigger than your sitting room. Here was his world banged like a fist on broken chairs, bare table, and the sideboard dresser where he kept his cups. One wooden only door, still latched, hasp broken. One window, wooden, broken. Four slats still intact. Darkness pours from these wrecked boards and from the crab-torn spaces underneath the door. These are the deepest reaches of time's long attack. The roof, dark shingles, silvered in some places by the wind, the fingertips of weather, shine still secure, still perfect, although the plaster peels from walls, at sides, at back, from high up near the roof, in places where it was not painted. But from the front, the face from which it looked out on the world, the house retains its lemon wash as smooth and bland as pearl. But the tide creeps in. Today's insistence laps the loneliness of this resisting cabin. The village grows and bulges. Shops, supermarket, postal agency whose steel spectacled mistress rules the town. But no one knows where Tom's cracked limestone oblong lies. The house, the postal agent says, is soon to be demolished. A housing estate's being spawned to feed the greedy town. No one knows Tom now, no one cares. Slaves' days are past, forgotten. The faith, the dream denied, the things he dared not do, all lost if unforgiven. This house is all that's left of hopes, of hurt, of history. So we have this tiny, rundown, cabin, right? In which this man lived his entire life. Um, <clears throat> the front maintains the same kind of patience facade that Tom did, right? From the front, the face from which it looked out on the world, the house retains its lemon wash as smooth and bland as pearl. And what's going to happen to this house? 
is it going to fall apart on its own? It's going to take a lot of things for that house to fall apart. Well, the, the town that's growing up around it is going to demolish it in order to build a new housing estate, right? So they're gonna put up like a new suburban development mm -hmm. where this cabin used to be. Now, does the poem seem to think this is a good thing or a bad thing, do you think? Uh, I feel like it's a bad thing. That would be correct. Because yeah. <laughs> <Yes. laughs> people do that now. <laughs> sure, yeah. And you know, like, you know, think of it as like, have you ever seen the, the first Poltergeist movie? Okay. Oh, that's the newest. One with, with girl and TV stuff. Okay, well, I, I guess the, 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 there was some girl in, in TV stuff in the, the, in the first Poltergeist, but like the reason their house is being haunted is that they've built this whole suburban development. Yeah, under a whole yeah on a Native American burial ground, right? And that's one thing you kind of do. Yeah, it, and you know, it, it's. I think Braithwaite is talking about the same kind of thing here. It's about a kind of erasure of history in pursuit of wealth and comfort and modernity and new development, right? Mm -hmm. So it's he makes it pretty clear that nobody here remembers Tom, right? Nobody knows where his tombstone is. Um, oh, those days are all long past and forgotten, right? But I think he also seems to regard something as lost when you forget about that history and just kind of like push forward relentlessly into the future. Mm -hmm. That Tom's house, even though maybe it's not livable anymore, still has value as a symbol. You okay? Mm -hmm. Okay, so... Um, I think we've actually kind of covered a lot of ground on this in an hour, right? Um, is there anything in this that you are having a really hard time understanding that you're struggling with or that you want to ask about? I know I was reading it and I was like, wait, what was I reading? And I uh -huh. kept reading it and I kept reading it and like, oh. And I figured out all about reading questions. <laughs> Yeah. Poetry is kind of hard to understand. Oh sure, yeah. Well, yeah. It's, it's it's not it's not straightforward narrative. Yeah, it's not. There's no story being told here. It's and you know like all these poems are linked, but it's not always immediately obvious what's linking them. Sometimes the language is a little hard. But yeah, I hope that you have at least a little bit better sense of what the logic is that links all of this together. And at least what some of the thematic trends are that run through the whole thing. Because I mean, you're like, you know, this, 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 this is, you know, this is just kind of, you know, my two cents. You're like, this is a damn good poem that more people should read. <laughs> All right. So Wednesday, we're going to review for the midterm. Um, when I get back to my office in a minute, I'll send you a reminder to send me your proposal so I can give you feedback. I had to open my email anyway. Housing just got back at me. <laughs> uh, I'm dealing with some cursing things. Right. I, 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 figured, I figured you must be given that, um, you know, you're, 